Well, for those that don't know, I killed a pretty significant deer here in Michigan during the bow season this year. And as I shared this story with my friends, they thought that I should share it. So, here we go. I started hunting this property about eight years ago, and the property itself is just over 40 acres. It doesn't offer really great habitat. It's got some so-so bedding into it. No crops, very few oak trees. And when I started hunting the property, um, there was not a buck living on this thing a year and a half older or older. Um, there was a handful of very, very small bucks, and I learned very quickly that there were multiple trespassers in there. And it took me about two years with the DNR involvement to get all the trespassers, cameras and stands and that stuff out of there so I could start managing the ground. The buck I shot was a six and a half year old buck that I had five years of history with. I nicknamed the buck Shredder because his rubs always completely shredded the trees. I first encountered this buck hunting with my daughter when he was a two and a half year old. I did not save any of those pictures because I didn't realize there'd be any significance to the story that I'm about to tell. At that time, he was an eight point buck, just your typical two and a half year old eight point. At three and a half, I never thought too much of him based on the trail cam pictures. When I seen him in person at 25 yards, I realized he had a little bit better mass than what I thought. He was a mainframe eight point with a split brow time. I decided to roll the dice and see if he could make it through the season. Later, I'll get some pictures on my clover plot that would prove that he survived the deer season. At four and a half, he took my breath away. The amount of growth between three and a half and four and a half was incredible. He was now a mainframe eight and both brow tines were split and he was sporting some very heavy antlers. He was officially my target buck for the season and my focus was positioning myself in front of that deer. At that time, I was running about 30 trail cameras in the area and learned approximately where he bedded and generally where he exited. Then late October, I seen him on his feet before dark at about 50 yards. A week later, I was hunting Kansas and I received a trail camera picture revealing that one of his brow tines were busted off. To me, that was a deal breaker and I never stepped into that ground again to give him some sanctuary and cover to hope that he makes it through the season. I learned that he had indeed made it through and he was once again using the same part of the clover plot that he used the previous season in the winter. In fact, both of those years, he used the exact same spot and daylighted for nearly two straight weeks in December while trying to reestablish his body weight. With that information, I knew he would be in serious trouble in December of 2021 if I had not caught up with him. Another thing I learned about him is that he used part of the property that I had no stands, and more importantly, that he daylighted frequently returning to his bedding area late in the morning. So the following year, I hung some new sets and I added some new food plots. Another thing I learned during that time frame is that he really, really, really hated cameras. These cameras literally stressed this deer out and he was avoiding them. At five and a half, he had not really changed very much. His main beam length was a little bit longer and he was a little bit heavier, but he was pretty much the same deer. He remained my number one target buck, and I didn't see him in person until mid-November. He was running a doe so fast and hard, I could not get him to stop as he passed by me at about 30 yards. I had a few more pictures of him after that, and then he pretty much vanished. I waited hopeful that he would return to the clover plot in December, and when he didn't, I wrote him off as dead. When I pulled the trail cameras that spring, I found just one more picture of him in late January, during that year, I learned that I would usually only get one picture of him on a camera and then never again. I would turn the camera to the other side of the tree, get one more picture. I would move a camera 10 feet and get another picture. My plan was to put the cameras where I really did not want him walking and keep them away from my stands. Now, this buck was six and a half years old. I went through and I studied every trail camera picture of Shredder that I had. I connected every single dot that I could. I knew this about him. The majority of his life was on those 40 acres. He bedded in an area that I narrowed down to about 10 acres. There were multiple people hunting the same deer when he exited the property. He really, 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 really hated trail cameras. He loved to go to the clover plot in December. He would return to his bed later in the morning during the pre-rut. 
The majority of his daylight pictures occurred when the moon was between three quarters and full. It was time for me to develop a plan around those things. I added two more food plots and I hung two more stands. I put out my cameras very late to avoid putting any further pressure on him. I put out very few cameras and only outside of my shooting distance from my stands. When I hung cameras, I put them eight foot in the air and this did prove to be less invasive on him. I stayed completely out of there. I knew he was living there and I would only hunt him if the wind was absolutely perfect. The winds were a bit different this year and it would be late October before I could get my second set in. When I seen him, I knew it was him, but I couldn't see the rack. He approached the outer edge of my food plot and I prepared to draw on him at 30 yards, but then he turned towards me. What he was literally doing was walking a circle around the trail camera to come to the outer edge of the plot and I waited thinking he was going to come into the plot, but just as soon as he got there, he turned to walk away. I drew my bow, I leaned as far forward as possible, but I could not make the shot. I stood up, found a spot through the tree branches, put it where it needed to be, and the shot went off. The lighted knock disappeared. He ran out to about 60 yards, tail up, stopped, stood there, looked, observing the area. I didn't know what had happened, but I knocked another arrow. Convinced that the first arrow hit him, I would try to get another shot but the branches would not allow me to do so. He then just turned and walked off. I was losing my mind. I couldn't take it any longer. I rushed down to the arrow to find it steamingly red, and I walked over to where I last seen him, and 10 yards past that, there he laid. I scored him in the low 160s, my brother scored him in the high 160s, and I'm anxiously, anxiously <laughs> waiting for the drying period to be up so I can get him officially scored. He is absolutely my biggest buck to date, and I'm very grateful to tell this story. I found this last year's dead buck on this property. I had trail camera pictures of him from the year before. This is a one and a half year old deer. I'm not sure the cause of death, but just want to let everyone know the genetics are here. Only you, I, me, we, us can mess this up. Best of luck to you and Merry Christmas everyone.